A week without the Sabbath would be like an ocean without water, an orchestra without instruments, or a Christian without Christ. It just does not make sense. So I thank God for this seventh day, this set aside day, this sanctified day. The Sabbath is not only a sign, it's not only a command, but it is a blessing. And so whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your situation and however you are feeling, I want to wish you a happy, healthy and holy Sabbath day. May God bless you and your family. Now today, the passage we'll be studying comes from the book Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 to 14. Now before I read it, let me explain the contents of this passage and then the structure of this passage. In Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 to 14, we have the prophetic vision that Ezekiel receives from God. The vision is of a valley of very dry bones. Ezekiel records the things that he sees, the things that he hears, and the things that he experiences in this valley of very dry bones. He records the conversation between himself and God. God asks, Ezekiel answers. God says, and Ezekiel does. That's the contents of this passage. Now, these 14 verses that we're concerned with today has a simple two-part structure. Verses 1 to 10 is the vision. Verses 11 to 14 is the interpretation and the explanation of this vision. So let's read Ezekiel 37, beginning at verse 1. The prophet records, the hand of the Lord was upon me. That's ordination and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord that's transportation and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones that's expiration and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry that's investigation and he said unto me son of man can these bones live that's interrogation. And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. That's affirmation. Again he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's proclamation. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. That's resuscitation. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live. That's restoration. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. That's confirmation. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone, that's unification. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, that's organization. But there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come. From the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet. That's elevation, an exceeding great army. That's dedication. Now, for the explanation and the interpretation of this prophetic vision, verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our past. That's rejection. That's depression. That's desperation, separation and isolation. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God. Behold, O oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O oh, my people. That's intervention. And brought you up out of your graves. That's resurrection. And shall put my spirit in you. That's inspiration. And ye shall live. That's revival and reformation. And I shall place you in your own land. That's personal habitation. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, 
have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. I've lifted the very words from this passage and tagged this text with the title, In the Valley. Ezekiel was a PK. Today, a PK is a pastor's kid. Now, rightly or wrongly, generally, pastor's kids seem to suffer a certain stereotype. They have a bad reputation. Perhaps the reason for this is because the pastor, their father, tends to spend more time shepherding the flock and not enough time being the priest of his own home. Possibly the reason for the misbehaving PKs is because the holy pastor you see in church is not the same holy father they experience at home. Probably the reason why these PKs are not up to standard is because the expectation of the congregation is so high that they seem to forget that whilst these are pastor's kids, they are still just kids. A PK today is a pastor's kid, but a PK in the Bible was a priest's kid. Ezekiel was a PK. Priest's kids in the Bible were also notorious for their incredulous and rebellious behavior. You remember Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, who offered up unapproved, unauthorized, unholy, strange fire. This was in opposition and total contradiction to the command of God. Aaron, a good priest, his sons, bad PKs. And how about Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who took more than their fair share of the congregation's offering, who committed adultery with the women who came to the temple to worship, who stepped into the most holy place and brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that Ark representing and manifesting God's Shekinah glory, his holy presence. They took that Ark into battle and lost it in battle. Eli, a good priest. His sons, bad PKs. Ezekiel was a PK. But even though there was a certain stereotype attached to being a pastor's kid, Ezekiel made sure and ensured that he would not live down to the low standards others around would have expected of him, but that he would look up and live up to the standard God desired from him. And there's a preaching point right there that we need to stop looking and comparing ourselves to the people around us. But Matthew 5 verse 48 says that Jesus says, be be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so the only being we should be comparing ourselves with, the only standard that is worth measuring ourselves against, the only person we should be looking up to, living up to, likening ourselves to, is God, our heavenly Father. In the first chapter of the book of Ezekiel, verse number three, we discover that Ezekiel was not only a priest's kid, but he was a priest himself. You remember in the Old Testament how people brought their sacrificial animals to the priest. It could have been a goat or a lamb. If they were poor, they could have brought a dove or a pigeon. If they were rich, they could have brought an ox or a bull. And then the priest would take that sacrifice and offer it to God on behalf of the people. So a priest was the people's representative to God. But in our passage of study today, Ezekiel 37, verse number one, the priest records that the hand of the Lord was upon him and Ezekiel receives a prophetic vision. Ezekiel, who is a priest, is also a prophet. Now a prophet is God's representative to the people. God would give his prophets visions and oracles and messages to deliver to his people. A prophet was a mouthpiece of God and a spokesperson for God. Ezekiel was both a priest and a prophet. He was the people's representative to God and God's representative to the people. He was a mediator, an interceder, a go-between. Ezekiel was both priest and prophet. In his capacity as a prophet, Ezekiel is taken in vision to a valley of very dry bones. Ezekiel must have been horrified, terrified, petrified and mortified. You see, a priest should not have been in a place such as this. For Leviticus chapter 21 verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak 
unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among the people. Priests were supposed to avoid anything which was dead. Coming into contact with anything dead would render them ceremonially unclean and unholy. God is life, the source of life and the sustainer of life, and he is wholly apart from death. And because God is holy, the priests who served in a privileged position to appear before their most holy God were to stay away and keep away from anything which seemed unclean or deemed unholy. That included dead bodies and bones. But here stands Ezekiel the priest confounded because he's surrounded with bones, dry bones, very dry bones, many very dry bones. Many questions must have flooded his mind. Why were there so many very dry bones? Where did these bones come from? When did these bones get here? To whom do these bones belong? And what does this all mean? To answer these questions, I need to step back from preaching and do a little teaching. And so I welcome you to our Bible history class. Today's subject, a brief review and overview of ancient Israel's history. Now, the first three kings of ancient Israel were King Saul, King David and King Solomon. Understand that under these three kings, Israel was a united kingdom. However, After King Solomon's reign, the United Kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. Now, I did say that this was a history class. So if I'm the teacher and you are the student, I must give you homework. And so your assigned reading, your homework is to read 1 Kings chapter 11. By reading 1 Kings chapter 11, you will get insight and gain understanding to the context of this text. You will discover the reason for the united kingdom of Israel becoming the divided kingdom of Israel. Now the northern kingdom retained the name Israel whilst the southern kingdom took on the name Judah. Israel was made up of 10 tribes. Judah was made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The first king of the divided kingdom of Israel was Jeroboam, not to be confused with the first king of Judah, which was Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. Jeroboam was not. Understand that Solomon's temple was in Jerusalem and Jerusalem was in Judah and Judah was the southern kingdom. Jeroboam did not want the people in the northern kingdom to worship God in the southern kingdom. And so he set up idols, golden calves in various cities and invited people to worship them. The people regrettably accepted this invitation. God was displeased and as a result sent various prophets to warn them to repent from their sins or else they would be taken into captivity. Prophets of that northern kingdom included Hosea, Amos, Joel and Jonah. And of course, you know Elijah, who was sent to King Ahab and the people of Israel and asked, how long will ye halt between two opinions? But neither King Ahab or the rest of the northern kingdom remained faithful to God. And so in 722 BC, God allowed Israel to be destroyed by the Assyrians. Meanwhile, Judah, that southern kingdom, was still in existence, but they also began to worship other gods. Gods made of stone, metal and wood. In fact, they would worship the sun, the moon and the stars. And so God sent several prophets to Judah, which included Isaiah, Jeremiah, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk and Zephaniah. These prophets instructed the people of Judah to repent from their sins, to learn from the lessons and the consequences of the northern kingdom. But the people from that southern kingdom rejected the prophets and neglected to hear God's warnings. And so on three occasions, the Babylonians came and infiltrated Judah, annihilated the people and desecrated the temple. In 605 BC, 
the Babylonians took utensils from the temple and captives from Judah. The captives included Daniel and his three faithful friends. That was 605 BC. The Babylonians came again in 597 BC and took more utensils from the temple and took more captives from Judah. One of the captives from this second invasion was a man named Ezekiel. He was both a prophet and a priest. That was 597 BC. The Babylonians came again for the third and final time in 586 BC. This time they completely destroyed Jerusalem, Judah, its inhabitants, as well as the temple of the Lord. Here is where our history class comes to an end. We've gone from preaching to teaching, now we are investigating. This is CSI Judah, Judah's crime scene investigation. We're back in the valley of dry bones. But who do these bones belong to? We have to look at the evidence. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 9 reveals that these bones belong to the slain, meaning that these people were killed. Now, the next verse, verse 10, tells us that these bones are resurrected and they become an exceeding great army. Could it be that these bones belong to an army which was killed? That this graveyard was once a battlefield? Valleys in the Bible were places where opposing armies would do battle. Could it be? That this was the location where the armies of Judah formed a resistance against the armies of Babylon. The Babylonians had won, killing the Jewish people, leaving their dead bodies in the valley. Wild beasts would have eaten their flesh and the sun would have scorched and bleached dry their bones. Having your bones scattered and not buried was a terrible scene. It meant that nobody cared. And so our evidence points to these bones belonging to the inhabitants of Judah. Further evidence affirms that these were the bones of the Judean people. Check out Jeremiah chapter 8 verses 1 and 2. The prophet declares, At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. The Babylonians would dishonor, disrespect, and disgrace their enemies even more than they had done by digging up their graves and scattering their disjointed, disunited, disconnected, dislocated dry bones. This was a picture of no and so as they sat there in Babylon, considering their sad, sorrowful, despairing situation, they remembered how members of their own family had been murdered, their homes had been destroyed, and the temple, God's own house, had been demolished. And they said, we are dry bones, scattered with no hope of being reunited, dry, with no sign of life, in the valley, even God has forgotten us. In fact, they had misinterpreted and misunderstood what God told Moses to tell them in Exodus 25 verse 8. God had said, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But these people thought that if God no longer had a sanctuary, that he was no longer dwelling with them. They thought that because of their situation, they were alone. This was worse than social distancing. This was spiritual distancing. 
God was far from them and there was nothing that they could do. They were in lockdown in Babylon, locked out from the presence of God, isolated from divine help, separated from divine hope. If only they had gone to God's word, they would have found in Daniel 7 verse 9 a picture of power, a portrait of promise and a figure of faithfulness. In Daniel chapter 7, God foretells through the prophet Daniel the rise and fall of world empires. In verse 4, we have Babylon pictured as a lion with eagle's wings. In verse 5, we have the Medo-Persian kingdom portrayed as a bear with one shoulder higher than the other and three ribs in its mouth. In verse 6, we have Greece symbolised as a leopard with four wings and four heads. And then in verse 7 and 8, there is Rome, political Rome and then religious Rome, pagan Rome and then papal Rome, the emperors and then the popes. But then in verse 9, thank God for verse 9, we have encouragement that no matter what is happening in the world, in spite of your condition, despite your situation, there is hope for your hopelessness. There is comfort for your loneliness. There is grace for your wretchedness. The prophet reports in Daniel 7 verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool his throne was like the fiery flame and the wheels as burning fire powerfully and beautifully and eternally pictured as the ancient of days and so you need to know that you may be stuck in the valley but our valleys are temporal But our Jesus is eternal. Whilst in lockdown, we need to look up and see that above the earthly governments, there is a heavenly government and God is in full control. He is seated upon his throne. Now, the fact that his clothes are white tells us that he's righteous. The fact that his hair is white tells us that he's all-knowing. The fact that his throne is flame-like tells us that he reigns in holiness. But the powerful and poignant point that I must point out is that this throne, his throne, has will. Ah, my sisters and my brothers, God was not limited or restricted to that torn down temple in Jerusalem. But wherever his people are, he is with them. He dwells with them. And so God took the people's own words in verse 11 of Ezekiel 37. Our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. He took their own words and gave Ezekiel a two part vision. Firstly, Ezekiel proclaimed the word of God to the bones and the bones came together. The old Negro spiritual puts it this way, the toe bone connected to the foot bone and the foot bone connected to the heel bone and the heel bone connected to the ankle bone and the ankle bone connected to the knee bone and the knee bone connected to the thigh bone and the thigh bone connected to the hip bone and the hip bone connected to the back bone and the back bone connected to the shoulder bone and the shoulder bone connected to the neck bone and the neck bone connected to the head bone now hear the word of the lord that's what one song says but hear what the bible says the bones put on the sinews and the sinews put on the flesh and the flesh put on the skin all because of the word of the lord now don't get me wrong The situation has improved. They were dry, scattered bones, but now they are dead bodies. The situation has improved, but they're still dead. But the vision isn't over. In the second part of this vision, Ezekiel proclaimed the word of God to the wind and the breath came into those lifeless bodies and the breath caused those lifeless bodies to be living beings. From dry bones to lifeless bodies, from lifeless bodies to living beings. And here is what my favourite preacher would say is the experience the power moment. This vision tells us more than just the future state of the dead. It tells us about the present state of the living. Pause, stop, rewind and replay. This vision tells us more than just the future state of the dead. It tells us about the present state of the living. Yes, 
the dead in Christ shall rise. That's the future state of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 foretells, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That is the future state of the dead. But check out what this vision says about the present state of the living. There is a difference between a lifeless body and a living being. This two-part vision in Ezekiel 37 informs us that we need the word of God as well as the spirit of God. It was in the beginning. That at his word, God called everything into existence. Then in Genesis 2 verse 7, God formed man in his own image. It was a lifeless body. But when God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, that lifeless body became a living being. And just as we need the breath of God to sustain us physically, we need the spirit of God to sustain us spiritually. We don't have to go very far in our Bibles to learn about the Spirit of God. For in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, that which was formless, that which was shapeless, that which was hopeless. It was God's Spirit that was present in creation and in transformation. Let me go a little deeper. The word spirit in Genesis 1 verse 2 is the Hebrew word ruach. Ruach is the same word in Ezekiel 37 verse 14 for spirit. Ruach is the same word in Ezekiel 37 verse 9 for wind. Ruach is the same word in Ezekiel 37 verse 5 for breath. So let me say it again in case you missed it. Just as you need air to breathe, we need the spirit of God to live. You may be experiencing personal problems. You are in the valley. You're struggling financially. Dry bones. Your marriage is dead. Dry bones. You are physically sick. Dry bones. Your relationship with God is non-existent. Dry bones. Dry bones represents no hope. Your situation is incurable irreparable and irreversible but if you can believe that at his word and with his spirit God can bring to life that which was dead surely God can turn around your financial situation surely God can breathe life into your dead marriage surely God can heal your sickness and straighten up your backsliding and mend your brokenness and fill your emptiness and comfort your loneliness and give you his holiness The name Ezekiel means God strengthens and God will surely strengthen you when you are in the valleys of life. He strengthens you through his word and through his Holy Spirit. We are not alone. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 says that Jesus' name would be Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. And so just like Ezekiel was referred to as the son of man, I'm reminded of how Jesus is not only the son of God, but he is the son of man. He is the living word conceived by the Holy Spirit. Divinity clothed in humanity. Jesus is God's representative to mankind and mankind's representative to God. He's our mediator, our interceder, our goal between both prophet and priest. Even in lockdown, God strengthens us by his word, through his Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. No wonder the psalmist says, though I walk through the valley, I said the valley. I said the valley. David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. You may be in the valley, but God is above you to watch over you. You may be in the valley, but God is beneath you to uphold you. You may be in the valley, but God is beside you to comfort you. You may be in the valley, but God is behind you to protect you. You may be in the valley, but God is in front of you to lead and to guide you. You may be in the valley, but God is outside of you to give you help. You may be in the valley, but God is inside of you to give you hope. Son of man, can these bones live? 
with the word of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus, you can experience hope, peace, and joy, even when you are in the valley. Is there something in your life which is hopeless? Let's take it to God in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you that as tired as we are, we worship a God who neither slumbers nor sleeps. We thank you that as lonely as we may feel, we know that we have a God who will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you that as hopeless as things in our lives appear to be, we can be assured that you know the thoughts that you think toward us, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give us an expected end. Grant us your peace, give us your grace, forgive us of our sins and strengthen us in our valleys. And may the presence and power of your Holy Spirit be experienced in our lives. So breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with a life anew that we would love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Emmanuel. Amen.